Go up the stairs. There's some mock-ups, and of course there's a downtown building which had uh, this palimpsest of a stamp advertisement. Ed Olszewski, I was uh, uh, on the faculty of the Department of Art History at Case Western Reserve University for uh, more than 40 years. and became interested in the free stamp when uh, British Petroleum took over from uh, Ohio and rejected the sculpture, which uh, left me dumbfounded because this was a world-renowned sculptor and uh, works of his have been installed in cities, major cities throughout the country. Oldenburg has been associated with pop art from the very beginning of his career. And in England, pop art uh, had negative connotations. Uh, it was uh, political in its emphasis. Uh, it was critical of uh, um, uh, the establishment. And I think that that left a bad aftertaste in the mouths of the uh, executives uh, at BP. So uh, they didn't appreciate the whimsical nature of the sculpture, uh, which is a caricature in the sense that uh, it is oversized and it puns on size and uh, medium as well. Um, so uh, I uh, wrote to the executives both in uh, Cleveland here and in London and um, was able to circulate a petition among the four institutions of higher learning in the United States or in Cleveland and um, uh, as a result uh, we sent a petition to um, the executives but of course uh, um, they did not respond immediately. Uh, when they finally, after much encouragement, uh, did issue a response, they simply maintained their position that the sculpture was inappropriate, uh, whatever that meant. And I think that inappropriate meant for them uh, uh, something with the bureaucratic monopoly implied uh, in a hand stamp. Uh, so they gave the uh, sculpture to the city of Cleveland. Two uh, committees of city council um, have voted favorably uh, on the sculpture, a Parks and Recreation Committee and a Fine Arts Committee. Uh, so there really was no controversy until um, the head of city council, George Forbes, became involved in the issue and he said that if the work was not good enough for VP, it was not good enough for the city of Cleveland. The problem with Willard Park was that uh, George Forbes felt uh, that uh, it implied uh, city council as a rubber stamp for uh, the business interests in Cleveland and that um, uh, the city had just given a number of uh, 
of, of tax abatements to uh, several corporations in downtown Cleveland. And so they were very sensitive to that criticism. And it was a criticism that was made in letters to the editor. So uh, it was not something that they imagined. It was a, a real concern that they had. As long as George Forbes was president of council, uh, the, uh, the gift was not moving forward. Uh, but the people who were against accepting the gift were very outspoken. And there were only about five or six members of city council at the time uh, who uh, objected to it. Things changed when uh, George Forbes uh, uh, decided to run for mayor of the city of Cleveland, and uh, uh, George uh, Voinovich uh, was running for governor, so he had stepped aside. At that point, uh, uh, the election went forward, and uh, one of the members of council, Michael White, uh, defeated George Forbes, and uh, there was a new um, administration in place. Horton, who was the CEO of um, Sohio, uh, had um, approached Jay Westbrook, the new president of council, or president-elect at that time, and uh, Westbrook was uh, uh, an immediate champion for accepting the sculpture. So I think that the votes were already in place at that point, um, but uh, there was a, a good bit of lobbying that was going on as well and a lot of behind-the-scenes activity. Um, so it was this change of administration that made the difference and that finally moved the project forward and uh, saw it to the installation in Willard Park. Um, with reference to the free stamp, um, uh, Oldenburg and Van Bruggen uh, work on a large scale with um, objects uh, that they choose for their sculptures that are extensions of the human self, that are tools, like a hand stamp, or the clothespin in Philadelphia, or the bat column in Chicago, or the spoon bridge in Cherry in Minneapolis, um, the flashlight in Las Vegas, uh, we have the buried bicycle in, in Paris, and uh, the um, uh, uh, broken bowl fountain uh, in Miami. So. Uh, these objects are simple objects. Tools, by their very nature, tend to be simple. Uh, there is, I think, perhaps a sense of frivolity in what uh, Oldenburg is doing in that uh, his objects are oversized and uh, they pun on material, uh, they pun on scale, uh, and in that sense then they can be seen as somewhat humorous, but for the most part uh, they are uh, very serious objects. So when you look at Free Stamp Downtown, uh, it uh, uh, is related to the buildings surrounding it. Uh, uh, it has uh, curved forms and uh, inviting colors. The hues are red and pink, which are warm uh, and advanced. Uh, they are set against the serried ranks of the columns of City Hall, uh, or you have um, uh, the ziggurat-like building uh, on the other side of uh, the sculpture. And at the same time, in, in its um, diagonal placement and its corner placement in the park, it eludes the tyranny of the federal building across the street, uh, which is 35 or more stories. Uh, in the end, it points toward uh, uh, the BP building. So that its configuration is part of what we would call its iconology. That is, um, its meaning is uh, related to the way in which it is positioned in the park. And it points toward uh, the BP building and toward the, uh, the 43rd story of the BP building where the executive offices and the meeting room of the Board of Trustees are located. Uh, so in a sense, it, it yearns for um, the site that had been originally intended for it. Uh, it's been rejected by BP. And it becomes free in that sense. It's free of its uh, unappreciative patron. Uh, it's free of its original site, which was a pad that the architects had uh, placed uh, on the building when it was first constructed. 
So the sculptors were not free in the placement of the work initially. Um, and as a result, uh, uh, its rejection freed it from uh, that kind of uh, uh, confinement. Uh, and uh, its rejection also toppled it. So now that you can see the word free uh, on the sculpture. And uh, it, uh, it then uh, announces its own freedom in a sense. Uh, the lettering, of course, is backward. We know that Oldenburg is uh, a masterful uh, print artist, and whether he makes lithographs or woodcuts or engravings, uh, the image is always in reverse. And then when the uh, impression is made uh, and the print produced, uh, it uh, is seen uh, as it should be viewed. So uh, the spectator, in a sense, becomes a tabula rasa, a blank sheet, when he or she walks past the word free and reverses that word in his or her own mind. Um, so uh, we see a little bit of the printmaker involved uh, in, uh, in that placement. Uh, Oldenburg also likes the geometry of the word free. It, it, it's architectonic in a sense because of the right angles in the letters F and the two E's. And then you have uh, the diagonal on the curvature of the letter R uh, which takes on a, a Cyrillic character uh, in the checkerboard of Slavic neighborhoods in Cleveland. So there's a kind of appropriateness there as well. Um, uh, so that the formalism of the uh, sculpture is uh, a very important aspect of it. Uh, I lectured uh, a few years ago at the Sculpture Center, and there was a, uh, uh, a sculptor in the audience who came up to me after the lecture and said that uh, he had mustered out of the military a few months before, and as he was uh, completing all the paperwork, uh, going from the federal building to City Hall and back to the federal building and to the Justice Center, uh, he would pass the word free each time he had his documents stamped, and uh, for him that had uh, a very personal resonance. Uh, so what becomes of free stamp or what becomes of that sculpture, I think, will uh, be a matter of um, interpretation on the part of uh, the citizens of Cleveland and how people view the work as they uh, encounter it on a daily basis. Uh, its placement at the corner of the park uh, makes it more immediate for spectators, whether they're walking uh, across the sidewalk or uh, driving past. Uh, and so I think that uh, the location for the work uh, was a, a bright choice on the part of the sculptors uh, uh, when they finally uh, decided how to position the work. This uh, is a major, a major preservation project for the city uh, on a number of levels. The opportunity to work on one of Klaus and Koja's great monumental outdoor pieces, having worked on quite a number of others, both smaller uh, studio scale objects, so to speak, as well as other outdoor sculpture in and around uh, Cleveland and the state. It also allows for some really interesting perspective. And it's really important to bear in mind that even though one may not think it, looking at the free stamp, the affinity that he very much so had for materials is actually quite remarkable. And that is really noticeable and almost dramatically interesting because of the incredible range when you're at his studio and you see the multifaceted approaches that he had to making objects in a maquette format first and actually making multiple maquettes trying to develop the form in a, in a more focused formalist way using different diverse materials that he's put together 
which is part of a great tradition of model making. Having the opportunity to see many of those permutations to the final, final piece uh, allows for a very, very stimulating insight into how Klaus Oldenburg's mind actually worked within the scope of the creative process. Current state of preservation of the free stamp, which motivated our intervention, actually is, is of some great significance. Anyone familiar with the horrendous weather that Clevelanders have to endure and the severe environmental conditions that every outdoor object encounters and has to, no pun intended, weather, it has had a uh, rather irregular history of maintenance and oversight and as a result of there not being continual thorough maintenance plan for the for the for the artwork uh, some amount of the deterioration which of course initially would be just an incipient process began to sort of aggregate and become worse and worse that having been said by the time ICA, ICA Art Conservation, was ultimately involved in examining the preservation status of the piece, we were able to record some very significant and, and troubling condition phenomena, most important of which was a substantial amount of interior corrosion of the steel. And that had occurred for a number of reasons. Corrosion is an very insidious process because it begins rather superficially, but then it continues to literally eat into the structure of the virgin steel itself. And as the corrosion continues to grow, invasively destroy new fresh steel material that actually makes up the structure of this whole object. And that actually is what we were uh, observing primarily on the interior of the piece. And which gave us real concern is that there's a very complex series of structural struts that actually hold the skin of the free stand together. And some amount of the structural steel wells, which hold the structural steel against the skin of the, of the exterior steel itself, were beginning to show significant signs of corrosion, meaning that left unattended to, there would be eventual failure. That could be disastrous. There, there's no question that the interior had very serious challenges which created important concerns for us about its long-term preservation. And the fact is, because it was the interior of the piece, it was far less obvious in terms of one's general inspection of this sculpture. I think that's the critical thing to bear in mind. Accessing the interior of the sculpture is very difficult. It is, there's a very small port which is bolted to the top of the stamp pad itself, which is only accessed through a bucket lift. There's a, a fairly elaborate series of steps, platforms, and a ladder that allows you to, to descend into the stamp itself for more thorough inspection. Obviously those were put there during the process of fabricating this piece. The important thing that I want to stress about that is that it was not readily obvious. Normal forensic examination of this work of art, this sculpture, might not allow you an interior, thorough interior, should I say, inspection. The preservation of outdoor sculpture is a ongoing process. In this case, there was some very serious structural alterations that were beginning to occur. The ICA, which has been dealing with the preservation of cultural material 
for over six decades was a natural partner in addressing these serious concerns that ultimately only through extensive forensics that the ICA staff brought to this did we actually see the severity of the corrosion that was actually taking place and put that into context with the challenges that the failure of the exterior paint coats had had and the corrosion that was occurring on the surface which radically affected the actually the viewing experience of the artwork as well as the artist's intended aesthetics. That whole synergy was really the overused cliche of the perfect storm that we had to deal with the exterior which which was seriously compromised but also with the concerns associated with the corrosion of interior steel and we see the universe in, in the long view. We're not just thinking about the problems that uh, exist today, but we're able to understand that as these problems continue to accelerate, they will become far more severe, far more complicated to address, far more costly to actually deal with. And ultimately, that is a big part of what the ICA does in terms of being the advocate for works of art which has no voice of its own. Our intervention into that process is dealing with the synergy of both, which is fundamentally structural as well as aesthetic. And that is the very, very important message to be aware of. And that is really one of the main missions that ICA Art Conservation and its 60-year heritage as a conservation preservation center does and it's done it for thousands and thousands of objects throughout our region in the country and and overseas and hopefully we'll continue to do it for decades uh, in the future. made this drawing for an apartment building on the river meeting in Stockholm. Wow, that's actually really cool. Yeah. You know, generic, but it wasn't Ohio it was, related. It was, no, it was going to be uh, uh, Ohio uh, <laughs> yes. Absolutely. No, I handle very, that. I like this one very much. Yeah, yeah it's cool. Oh, it's fun to see all of these uh, models. It's sort of, uh, things like, these are mostly uh, small things like the Valentine's presents. And, uh, mm. Very nice. I love the soft musical instruments. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Did, did you have any kind of reaction to the, the sort of mixed feelings that the public gave the free stamp? I mean, no, I don't think I was aware of that at that point. So okay. I didn't stick around. But I mean, well, of course, I was aware there were a lot of mixed feelings. As always, you know, when you put up a sculpture, I mean, I've gone through it in Des Moines and, and uh, you know, you probably, City and other places. 
but that, that goes away. It does. Yeah, it goes yeah. away. It does. You know, it's really interesting how people forget those small battles mm -hmm. associated with our work. Yeah. You know, and, and they develop a, a fabulous life of their own. What I like about large culture outdoors is that you see it every day. Sure. And you're going to work, and it's different. The snow is on it. Yes, absolutely. It goes through all of these Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, I, I'm getting into, I'll get into, the, there'll be chapters dealing with the controversy, and I'll be uh, showing some of these uh, cartoons that were made. Uh, mm -hmm. I remember this one, yeah. I don't know. Did you see? <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> they are pretty funny. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Have any of your has any other piece that you've done uh, of the monumental sculpture attained so much notoriety in such a while? Well, the shuttlecocks had something. Of well, it, yeah, the the uh, shuttlecocks are very much uh, appreciated. And there they had a, a situation where the football team was losing, the professional football team was losing all the time. So there was actually a group form that was going to take down our sculptures so that the wow. football team would win again. Wow. <laughs> That's really bizarre. <laughs> That's so yeah. Kansas City. Yeah, totally crazy. <laughs> Unfortunately, oh, it didn't awesome. happen, but that one, that one attracted a lot of attention too, yeah. That's a marvelous project in my mind because you have so many drawings. For the shuttle yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, that goes back many, many years. I went to Kansas City and I saw this vast field. Right. And my first project for it was uh, pool balls, large pool balls. Uh, it was just like a, a pool ball scene. Right. Well, okay. and, and they uh, they chased me out of town. <laughs> and so. It, it eventually worked out, but uh, it, it took a different form. It took the, the pool balls grew wings, you know, uh, and so they were they were really round things, but but they had wings on them so, because they were shuttlecocks. Oh, oh, got it. Okay, yeah, yeah sure, sure, sure. The transition. That's yeah, really yeah, great. Yeah, 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 that's yeah, cool. That yeah. That, and that gave you a story, like right. how they had descended from right. the sky, and right, yeah. right, like that. and how they might go back up. Right, down. right, mm -hmm. wow. Yeah. You turned them upside down and it became a TP. Yeah. 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 Um, you, Koshan, you visited Cleveland in 1986 to look at sites. And you looked at, I think, three or four. I know there, there was a group that included uh, a representative of the mayor's office, somebody from BP, um, uh, Hunter Morrison from the mm. City Planning Commission. Uh, they uh, independently, perhaps even without Koshia's and your knowledge, were looking at sites. And they looked at 11 different sites mm -hmm. and vetoed a few of them. George Forbes, who was head of council at the time, was, didn't want to see anything on Public Square. Uh, uh, he, he was a the villain. Yeah, he right. Held he, it up for a long time. He's the heavy in this story. Yeah. 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 It always, it always, it's always taken care of by elections. Yes. yes. <laughs> Suddenly someone moves so. You know, like that disappears. Yeah, yes. exactly. Yeah. He, nice by the way, he yeah, still right. uh, he still floats in the ether. Yeah, of well, he was head of an a ACP. In yes, it, but he's, yes. I think he's since resigned. But you can't always count on the change. It can get even yeah. worse. That's right. right. That's true. That's, right. that's true. Yeah, that's another yeah. thing that affects this stuff. That public work is the is, is the politics. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah so you, right. you you were only shown four or five sites when yeah, Kosha and you were uh, there. I can't remember day. that visit. Was, you think it was 86? It was 86. Uh, I think it was February 6, something like that, of 86, from, from my notes. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I keep diaries, but uh -huh. uh, when, uh, of course, I didn't believe in diaries. Uh -huh. uh, so uh, I had to slowly work back. It, uh -huh. She first made me throw them all away. Oh, really? I, I had to work my way back. And by 86, I think I had reached a point where I was starting to make diaries again. Uh -huh. I see. So I may have it in my. Yeah, uh, okay. But I don't remember. If I find something that I haven't seen before that's very good and promising, I get very excited. Uh -huh. Vinyl was such a thing. Right, right. And when vinyl came out, it was extremely high quality. Yes. It was thick and it was colorful, but the color lasted. It didn't fade. Yes. And uh, it was... Uh, Difficult to sew, but it, it could be sewn. It, could, it was it was very nice to use that, and I uh, 
Patty learned how, saw that saw that uh, you know very sure she was making those she had to you had to be absolutely perfect at doing it because uh -huh. you couldn't uh -huh. make a hole in it because the hole right. didn't fill up it, you had to be uh, you had to try three or four I times understood. before. Well, the paints you you were using stable paints, you know, the enamels and Liquitex pretty early. Yeah. You used Liquitex, uh, as far as I know, really, really early on, as yes. soon as it came out. Yeah, I did. Yeah. So you were right on the edge of all these new materials yeah. that were coming out. And I had used I had used uh, oil before that right. enamel. enamel. Right. And the problem with enamel is they they left out the lead. Yes. At a certain point, and then right. it didn't have the color that it had. That's that's right. And the color didn't last as long. Right. That's right. That's the last time the vinyl came in, so that that took the place of vinyl. Got it. Got it. Okay. So then you basically were always looking for a material that helped you achieve your aesthetic intent. Yes. So that yeah. it, it was not the material per se, but that it it helped you realize a particular aesthetic intent. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's that's really clear. Yeah. That's really really clear. It, at least from the, the, the painted pieces that, that I'm that I'm familiar with, they, they but they all they all have this very 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 free expressionist quality to the way, to the way you were applying paint. Yeah, um, I believe in that too. I yeah, mean, yeah. Paint is fun. So, yeah. Fun, sure. I like paint is fun. That's good. Paint is fun. Yeah, it's, it's tasty. Yeah, it, right. You, want to put you know, uh, there there are myths about artists, uh, obviously eating paint, and it particularly, uh, particularly when you when you see its you know unctuous kind of mm. buttery tactility, it, yeah. it does kind of promote the mm -hmm. idea of eating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I've had that. I have to confess that. So it fits that. the store. Right. Well. Yeah. That's it. Exactly. It fits paint. The store. <laughs> right. 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 Perfect. Perfect. But free, of course, is a challenging word, and. Uh, uh, I know that when they had the opening, they collected a lot of stamps. You remember that? They gave me a whole collection of stamps oh. that they had collected huh. from the city hall and other places. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. I didn't know that. Yeah. I had those, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. So whether that means that this is a, an important object or an object that you want to get rid of. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> right.
that is too weird, man. What's that? The, this? What's a penis? Yeah, this is a penis you brought to a party. Yeah, that is too bloody weird, man. Yeah, I know. I, I, I might be suspect about that, but I'll, I'll let that go. No. This is a particularly strange thing. It's the atomic bomb striking To the block part of the stamp where there's a platform and then a ladder going up to daylight. Here on the front of the stamp you see huge delaminations of paint, rusty runoff patterns. 